Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Today is our first session for our model optimization workshops we're going to be hosting. This is great if you have any function of Anaplan as far as a model builder, maybe you're using it in your role day to day. So we have a panel of great uh, experienced people, master Anna planners, solution architects, model builders joining us each week. And today we're talking about list subsets. So I'm going to let the experts go ahead and take it over, but be sure to drop any questions you have in the comments and we'll answer them at the end. So Kamal, go ahead and take over. Thank you, Elena. Yes, everybody. Kamal Verma. Before we jump into uh, line item subsets um, and talking a little about what they are and how they're used and some ideas for where you can uh, utilize them within your models, some unique things that aren't uh, explicitly uh, stated in the Anaplan community itself. Um, just wanted to introduce myself. I'll introduce the company a little bit. Not going to dwell on these uh, couple of slides uh, for too long, uh, but uh, just to um, highlight that Axolytics has been in uh, business since uh, 2017. We've uh, gone ahead and successfully delivered many projects across multiple areas of uh, use cases. Um, that's one of the things that makes uh, Axolytics unique is that we are versatile um, and we do have expertise in not only supply chain, FP&A, SPM, but also headcount planning and all these other niche um, use cases that we continue to expand into. So if you do have any questions about uh, uh, Axolytics expertise or how Anaplan can help you on your journey, please do reach out to us. Next, I would just like to go ahead and do a quick introduction about my who I am. As I said earlier, Kamal Verma, I'm uh, the director of the SPM practice here at Axolytics. So while I've um, focused on SPM solutions um, for the past Mm, actually more than six years now. It's probably going on seven or eight years, actually, and done um, implementations for every aspect of SPM. So anything from incentive comp to TNQ to target setting, et cetera, um, but also have uh, uh, done a lot of use cases um, trying to do optimization and initial implementations for everything from supply chain, demand planning, demand forecasting. Anything that can be done in Excel or anything that is algorithm-based, can be done in the plan. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and let Brendan go ahead and introduce himself. Yeah, I'm Brendan Schumacher, Consulting Manager and Master Anna Planner here at Axolytics. I've been working in the Anna plan space for over five years, impl implementing both as a consultant and as an internal Anna plan administrator. Um, implemented use cases varying from you know, finance, sales planning to demand planning, you know, all the way to sales targets. So all, all sorts of different uh, use cases and uh, um, really been exciting to see the power of this platform and what we're able to use it for. And then Michael is also listed um, on this slide as well. Um, he is in the background uh, going ahead and monitoring questions. He's a level three model builder. He's uh, been very successful at going ahead and doing some um, FPNA implementations and demand and supply chain implementations. Also a great resource um, just to give you a uh, flavor for the expertise that uh, Axolytics brings. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump into line item subsets. So how does Anaplan define a line item subset? Um, is just a list of line items or a module or different modules within a, within a model. So that in itself seems very generic and many people may not understand what that means um, if, if they have not used uh, list objects before. I think one of the best ways to understand what a, what a line item subset is, is to compare it to a, a regular subset. So a subset in itself would be just a subgrouping of list items. So let's say you have a, a hierarchy of uh, organizational hierarchy, and uh, you may have at the very bottom level is your employees that roll up into your divisions and regions and into the overall organization. But at the very bottom level, you have individuals and maybe you only want some individuals to be able to be selectable because those are only have a specific specific individual have a role. You could go ahead and create a subset of those individuals. So then that could be used as a dimension when you are going ahead and uh, either doing calculations or planning purposes. So how does a, 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 a line item subset differ from a, a subset of, of, of a list? A line item subset would be all the line items that are created within a module itself and being able to go ahead and specify which of those line items from a module can either be made visible to specific people or 
um, which of those line items from that module are needed for planning purposes. And we'll go through some of these examples very shortly. Let me go ahead and switch over to um, Anaplan um, to show you some ways list items are being utilized. If there are questions about how these are created or the, the specifics of going ahead and building a list item, we can dig into those. But this uh, session is more about ideas for lists. And also if there's questions about uh, things that y'all are encountering um, when you are either building lists or even, even if you're um, creating build other aspects of uh, your Anaplan model, we, we would be happy to address. So you'll see here that I'm in the, the classic dashboard uh, rather than in the in the new UX. I'm demonstrating in the classic uh, just because um, it's easier for me to go ahead and switch from modules so you can see the underlying information rather than having to drop in from the app into the into the backend model. Um, one thing that I will note uh, about this is that in the classic dashboards, one, one of the drawbacks is that when things change in the background, they don't automatically get reflected. Um, so it will require a refresh of the page, and I'll show you how that happens. But in the new, just note that in the new UX, most of those refreshes won't need to be need to happen manually. It will just automatically be reflected if the background, if the backend configuration ch changes itself. But even before we we jump into this, I just wanted to see how many times uh, list items have been utilized by individuals um, themselves. So I don't know, um, Brendan, you want to talk a little about your experience about um, how often either clients are aware of it or how often this is something that you utilize in models? I'd say most clients are not typically aware of the power of a line item subset. I usually see them used more often in fp and a use cases where we're trying to create a p and l and you have line items that are you know in your input module with your different calculations and formulas having those as line items but then using them as a line item subset where you're referencing for any other reporting or transformation of that data later on so uh very powerful but typically clients don't really know, you know what, what the line item subset is doing yeah, I, I agree on, on my side as well. Over the, the many years, most clients don't know about them. Um, it's not something that's even heavily touted in the Anaplan community. Um, that's why when I started getting more involved with them, um, started seeing some more benefits. And so uh, today we just wanted to highlight four potential um, use cases for them and, and show you how you can leverage them to either make your models more efficient or more dynamic. So we'll go through those. Let's look at uh, uh, list items themselves. Um, and, and very quickly, I'm going to go through some of the configuration aspects. So there's always this uh, tab here in options pane uh, of line item subsets um, where you can create new ones and create them. Uh, typically, you want to go ahead and name them with the uh, list as their distinguishing factor, and then whatever the, the name would be for that uh, list item themselves. What I've, um, I'm going to focus on uh, test one. Um, Brendan will focus on test two. But in uh, test one, here's where you'd go ahead and define um, which module you would want to pull those line items from, and uh, or modules where you would want to pull those line items from. Uh, just note that if you want to pull it from uh, multiple modules, you would want to make sure that the dimensions of those modules are the same. So in test one, I, I decided to go ahead and pull my line items or select which line items um, from, from D01. So I'm saying that this is a data module and there's this ability to have imports and manual entry in this, in this module. You'll see in this module that there are many line items, some just summary items saying to go ahead and determine some ordering of uh, the line items themselves. But you'll see here that there's five import line items and three manual entry line items. In my list test one, what I decided to do, you know what, I say uh, in actuality, I just only really care about four of imports and two manual entries. So that means that in my uh, line item subset, the only options for people to uh, to view would be able to be those four import line items and these two data entry line items. Once you've gone ahead and created your list um, object itself and specified which line items from the underlying module or modules you would like people to have the ability to view or to interact with, then you're able to go ahead and specify visibility 
of those uh, specific line items. This is where I've created a system module where what I wanna do in this example is model role determines which line items a individual would be able to see. So in this example, very simple. Um, if you have uh, full access, if you're a full access model role, then you would have access to all these specific list items. Um, and again, I wanna make sure everyone is aware. I haven't added any filters. I haven't hidden any line items just because I've gone ahead and specified that it's only going to be these six uh, line items from the D01 module. Those are the reasons why I only see th those six line items as, um, as configurable. An executive in this example, I'm going ahead and saying is has only the ability to see these two import um, line items. If you go, go ahead and add additional ones, and then you'd be able to go ahead and um, see additional aspects. In this uh, example, very easy. Um, this is user-based configuration, but these, of course, could be calculation-driven as well. Um, so just depending upon what your underlying uh, needs would be uh, to determine how this would uh, be populated. Once you have uh, the, the system module, in this example, uh, what's happening is you'll have to do a, a separate module to do a lookup of what the person's role is in order to determine if they have access to specific uh, line items themselves. So in this module, there's a user maintenance uh, section where e each user who has access to the model has a specific model role. So uh, you would look up the person's user um, information um, and that would uh, sync up to their model role determining which line items from that uh, D01 module they would have access to. So you can see here, um, model role, because I've gone ahead and said that um, has access to these specific six of the seven, that I can only see those. Now, if I go ahead and add myself to um, the import five and I refresh it, and in real time, you'll see that I also have access to import five as well and I can make modifications to those as to the aspects. I can set things off and refresh and see that we have access to those uh, four line items at this point. And then of course, because this is a uh, user based um, and, and user role based, anybody else who's had access to the model and has been configured appropriately would have a, a different level of ability different um, role access. So if Brendan uh, logged into this dashboard, he would only see these two I items themselves. Now, if I go ahead and give myself a model role as executive um, and refresh, you'll see that I only have imports one and two as well. Right now, I, I, I've done this as configuration-based, and I mentioned earlier, these can, these can also be based upon um, rules or anything. And right now, I'm only doing this to go ahead and determine access to a specific line item, and uh, just in order for people to get go ahead and either um, make uh, updates to those uh, line items themselves. But what this can be done is be utilized for access drivers in, in order to set people's um, read and write permissions um, in the background as well. Uh, in, in case you need to go ahead and um, worry about security at the line item level. The other one I want to go ahead and mention on this dashboard is uh, option-based. And we won't go into the background of, of how this, this was created, but just to give people an idea of what some of the um, capabilities of the list items are themselves. In this example, created a, a list which is option-based. So what this is telling us is that I would have a list, which is just, this one is just a flat list, um, which has its uh, six options and gone ahead and configured that each uh, option has access to see specific aspects themselves. So what I'll do is say, if I go ahead and select option one, then I only see list-based option one. But if I do option two, then I would see option two. Um, and option four, I can see multiple things. I can see three different things. So what this can be powerful for, powerful for is as people make um, selective changes on their dashboard, you can control the specific view of the line items they're able to, to, to see. So if they're either making um, a selection uh, on another grid, 
or if they're making selections on even a, a chart, you'll be able to specify which line items can either are pertinent to the information that they're seeing above or that they can have access to to make modifications for. So I'll pause there and uh, pass it over to Brendan so he can uh, show you some of his um, build as well. Before I uh, move along here, we had a couple of questions in the chat here. First one here is, can we update, uh, change names, add line items, or delete line items from the new UX? And I believe the answer to that is no. All updates to structural elements of Anaplan need to be done in the back end. You can add and delete from lists if they are production lists and you have the correct um, actions on a page, but that's uh, kind of the only thing you can add and delete from. You can't change your line items or formulas on the new UX. Um, and the other one uh, question you had was, would leveraging a line item subset slow down calculation? I think my answer would be, depends on what you're going to do with that uh, line item subset. If you're going to do calculations off of it or if you're just going to use it, maybe I'll let Kamal we'll expand on that a little bit. The best answer for that is it depends. I haven't seen any slow, slowness um, based off of list items, um, but I'm sure there. Once I say uh, never, um, there's always some some example of where it does. But uh, I have not ever seen any slowness using list items. And then it looks like Michael just dropped another question in the chat of in the line item subset module, the base module we're using. Why are only some of the line items checkable? Um, and I believe the answer to that is that it has to be a number format. You yes. cannot have a line item that is a text or no data or list formatted in your uh, line item subset. And that's because with the collect function, there's uh, calculations that happen to aggregate that data to whatever dimensions you have. And you can't really aggregate things that are non-numerical. Exactly. So I guess uh, up kind of on the topic of having uh, user-based access and uh, controlling what users are able to see. I have a method that I've built uh, at several different clients. It's usually a kind of a fan favorite for some reporting is uh, different time filters and then filters for your product hierarchy or whatever hierarchy you're selecting to view. Um, so this, I'll kind of show you on the front end page here. On the new UX, as Kamal had said, this would update automatically if you were on the new UX, but however, the back end, we need to refresh every time we change. So the First filter based selector that I will show is based on time. So you're able to select, uh, you know, just for this, this calendar, we have weeks, months, quarters, years. If there's other, you know, days or uh, you don't have quarter roll ups in whatever calendar you're using, you can cut this out. But just for this base example, we have, you know, kind of a standard week, month, quarter, year uh, calendar type. So in here, you're able to come in and select by year, which type of data you want to view. So right now we just have FY20 and FY21 selected for quarters. So with that, we're able to see each quarter of the year. If we wanted to see months for FY20, we just like that, update it, and it populates all of the months for you, weeks, et cetera. So you, you can kind of control exactly what you're seeing as an end user. And this is all dimensioned by user. So as if you have, you know, you know, some concurrency, multiple users using the same dashboard and wanting to view data, they're able to select their different filters without running into each other because it's all user-based. So uh, kind of a handy thing. This I will note that this actually does also work if you have uh, charts or graphs in the new UX. You can also update what you see in terms of time scales on those charts. So I'll quick jump into the back end and show you Kind of how this is working here so we have it's two main modules the first one is the input module uh, that you're seeing right here at the top it's gonna be your user-based uh, inputs so you'll have a module that's just dimensioned by your user list and you'll have a time scale of year and then essentially it's just you're going to be your booleans for the users to input weeks months quarters years to select uh, we also have some conditional formatting so that it looks nice when we're on the page. It highlights what we have selected. Uh, you can configure that however you'd like, but you can see each user will then be able to put in their own different inputs. So Kamal can look at quarters for that. Um, you know, if we go to somebody else here, maybe if Rod is in the model, he just wants to look at weeks for the first year. That's what it will we'll filter for him. Uh, the interesting part is when we come over to the user time filter here, this is where actually the calculations happen. And you'll see that this module is dimensioned by weeks. And we have users as well. So we have a few steps to kind of 
set this up for yourself. So you need to have all of the uh, time dimensions with your time scales correct uh, to kind of prep those. So you're just taking the year value for each of those. So you're just saying if it's selected for the year, then give me a one, otherwise a zero. You know, if the year value for quarter is selected, one or a zero, et cetera, across all of that. And then it's as simple as using the ratio summary, which I think is something that's uh, very powerful that not many people know how to properly use. Um, so essentially what we do is we just take a summary of a ratio. So the ratio is going to take for year to have all periods always selected as true, technical divided by technical. And the technical is just uh, a dummy line item with the number one selected in there. So if you divide by one, you're going to get one. And then you kind of move on, so on and so forth. So you get to quarters. Your ratio summary is going to be year over technical. For months, it's going to be quarters over technical. Weeks, months over technical, et cetera. And then the filter is going to be whether your week equals one and you want a formula summary on that. And the reason you're doing those ratios is so that you can get the correct level um, in your final filter. So... Otherwise, there's no easy way to get whether a year is selected for a certain year or a quarter is selected because some, you know, if you have weeks, there may be um, a calendar year where you have 52 weeks, 53 weeks. So it's going to be easier to use technicals and use one to bring your data down to the correct level to filter on. Now, since this is user based and on both of these, I can select different levels to show and have my formula update just for my user access. I'll pause here. Do we have any questions so far? We did get a question within our chat, um, and it's a good one. For someone that is new to InnoPlan, these are custom built. What is the, the process like? So let me go ahead and answer that quick, but clear, but uh, Brendan, you may want to go ahead and expand on it. InnoPlan, when, when it's first uh, loaded, when you first get access to a workspace, is, is, is empty. So it's a platform solution. But everything is custom built. So in this example that Brendan is showing, this model has the ability to go down to the week level at, at planning purposes. In your specific case, you may only need to go planning at the, the month level. So you would may, maybe if you wanted to do something similar to this, you would only have access to month, quarter, year. Um, and then it could be for as many years as, as you wanted within the model, um, forward or backward. So all of that would be custom designed um by your requirements i don't have anything to add to that that that's that's perfect i mean whatever your time scale is whatever your use case whatever your business is uh how you guys run the business that that's how you configure this custom built so the second part of this um is something i've used for some reporting at uh at different companies will be you know your user base selector here we have a uh dummy product hierarchy in the back end here where i just created you know P1, P2, P3 for products. Um, you know, product line, just three items. Category, just a few items. So you'll see all the way down here to the SKU, just kind of a, a standard three level hierarchy. Now you can do this for as many levels of a hierarchy as you need. You have two levels. If you have eight levels, um, you'll be able to set this up the same way. Um, but essentially, I'm able to say, hey, as an end user, I just want to view you know, a quick high overview of you know, my last three years for quarters at the product line level. So I can see how line A is doing, line B is doing, line C is doing. So if I want to go and I want to drill down, I'm able to select that, refresh, and then see my product categories as well. So I can drill down into those categories um, and say I want to view SKUs. So you can do any combination. Um, you can do all three together. You can do, you know, SKUs rolling up to their product line, or you can do SKUs rolling, you know, just by themselves. So this is a nice, easy reporting tool. So you can go up and down a hierarchy, view more data or condense it. So you can view at a higher level. If it's going to be a quick overview. This is uh, becomes critical and uh, powerful. It's one for, for multiple reasons. One, reporting needs always change. So there may be times where uh, people may want to only see it at the bottom level, but then, you know what? Uh, I do need to see a summary, um, maybe for the executive level or Creating the, this also makes it easier on the back end to it to to administer it um, because uh, you won't have to create multiple views or use multiple modules in order to provide the report output. Exactly, you're, you're able to condense the number of 
grids or dashboards that you need to publish to accomplish what one module can, can accomplish with this filter here. A quick view of the back end um, is very similar to how the time filters are set up. So you have a selectors filter that is a module that is only dimensioned by users and line items. And then you just create a line item for each level that you want to view. So we just have product line, category, and SKU set up here. So whatever user is currently active, you can select what you need to see. And then the actual filter module is going to be the bottom level. So if you have three levels, this will be your level three. If you have eight levels, this will be your level eight. Whatever your bottom level is, that's what you need to filter at. So we'll go into here in the back end. And we see that we kind of have three prep lines for the Booleans that are selected. So it's just dimensioned by the uh, top level product line, by P2 category and users, and then by P3 and users. So just bringing that Boolean from a flat module with no dimensions into dimensioned line items. And then essentially it's the same exact thing that we did with time where you go, hey, if product line is selected, then one otherwise zero, category one or zero, skew one or zero. And then we just apply those ratio formulas with that technical to bring the one or zero into the correct uh, dimension here at the bottom level of P3. And you'll see it's exactly the same if it equals one with the formula summary. So that as everything gets selected, it will properly filter your levels here. In real time. In real time. Yep, exactly. And there's no, no need to go back into the back end and do selecting levels. You just need to apply this filter um, to your viewing module, which is also dimensioned at that bottom level, also by P3. And then here's where actually I apply these filters. You don't have to have these filter line items in the actual module itself. You can just reference the other modules. I like to do this sometimes so that as I'm referencing or I'm trying to clean up a model, I don't, you know, I know what is being referenced where. If I have a filter that's in the module, I know that, okay, I'm using this filter for review versus if I have a filter over in Cisco 7, I may not know where that's used exactly without doing a lot of manual tracing. So yeah, you just bring those filters in, create your view, apply those filters based on current user for your products from the uh, existing module, and then same thing with time. And you'll have what you need on your dashboard for publishing. Great. Thank you, Brendan. Any other questions? We've implemented this at a couple of our clients. Can you maybe give a real life example of how this is working at maybe an account we have? Sure. So there was one implementation we did for a um, kind of a replenishment inventory uh, use case where the client needed to see if they had enough product in stock at certain stores and those stores and the products would roll up to their parents. So you had, you know, stores, districts, regions, or you had just preprints like this with the SKU or category where they want to see, okay, if I want to see at a high level where I have any any inventory issues, I can click the top level, like, hey, here's my regions, here's my product lines, and then say, okay, there's issues in this region or in this product line, and then use these filters to drill down and get to where the root cause is. So if you have a certain store that is struggling or an entire district that's struggling, kind of helps you go up and down a hierarchy uh, that way to quickly get to an answer. And I've utilized it at a property management uh, use case. So individuals who are planning for their OPEX and CAPEX planning and um, HR planning cost, where as a specific cost type was selected, which line items impacted that cost and only being able to see those line items. So, right, you would have, there, there may be several types of um, costs that, uh, that contribute to the overall uh, OPEX um, for a for a property, they were able to go ahead and create all those different types of cost, and then based upon which cost was selected, the type of cost that was selected, it would show them whatever three or four line items that were um, they they could modify in order to adjust the the budget for that specific cost type, and then up, rolling up to that specific cost line item. Okay, so it's really versatile for a lot of different things, products, locations, CapEx, that kind of thing. 
Awesome. Well, I don't see any other questions. Thank you guys so much for sharing that. I'm sure it brought a lot of value to the people that are working in Anaplan on a day to day and can obviously see what an impact it can make. We hope you enjoyed this panel session. Be sure to check out more in our series. And if you're interested, be sure to hit subscribe and like so you can be the first to know about our next upload.